Hello and welcome to this episode of the Psychology Book Club podcast. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Hannah. And I'm Jake. Today we're going to be talking about the book Guilt, Shame and Anxiety by Peter Bregham. Um, this is, I really enjoyed this book personally. I thought it was almost the opposite of last month's book where last month's book, which was 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, um, which is one of the previous episodes of this podcast, it was a fairly easy read. It was a very easy read, actually. But as we discussed in the last episode, it was also quite superficial. Whereas I felt this book was, it was still very readable. It was a very interesting read. Um, it was slightly more academic and a slightly heavier read, perhaps. But it went really, really deep into these big topics of guilt, shame and anxiety and why we feel them, where they come from, um, questioning are they really necessary and then talking about how we can overcome them as well. So we, that's the book that we're going to talk about today. Just to get started, Jake, I'd be interested to hear what your general thoughts were about the book. I thought it was brilliant. I think it's one of the best books that we've uh, read for the Psychology Book Club. Really thought-provoking, really interesting. Um, it definitely left me with a lot to mull over and uh, very well argued as well. It's got He's got a, an unusual argument. In fact, one of the things about this book that's so interesting is it's very different to a lot of psychology books, especially because he clearly argues in this book that uh, guilt, shame and anxiety are negative emotions and that they are not useful and they're not... They're not necessary. They're not necessary. Mm. Um, which, you know, uh, I think, although a lot of people in psychology would would agree that guilt, shame and anxiety are emotions that are you know, that people suffer with and that, are, you know, a problem, create a problem for people and can be painful. Peter Bregan is really clear that these are emotions that, I can't remember the exact words that he used, but basically they are getting in the way of you actually living a full life and thinking properly. These are not not only unhelpful, but they're actually negative in terms of the impact that they have so they're sort of emotions to be overcome and outgrown as opposed to um respected i guess Mm. yes that was actually one of the parts of the book that i appreciated the most and that really provoked a lot of internal thought and discussion for me initially i was actually quite skeptical of this idea that not only um are guilt shame and anxiety not helpful because from what I've read before, I'm, I've very much read around the school of, well, you know, all of these things serve a purpose and they contain messages and our, our role as, you know, conscious human beings <clears throat> is to look for what those messages are and sort of think about, okay, well, why am I feeling this thing? And what what is the message in that? What is the lesson there for me? Um, whereas he takes that even further and says, not only are these things not helpful, and as you were just saying, Jake, they end up prompting us or or sort of almost coercing us, manipulating us into behaviours that are really counterproductive and um, really inhibit our growth as people. But he also makes a point that they're not necessary. And this was the part that I really grappled with for quite a long time after reading the book, because um, again, you know, I've I've read and I've heard that not so much um, shame, um, you know, shame is very widely talked about in psychology as being an unhealthy and unhelpful emotion. Um, but guilt in particular, the way that I have thought about guilt and the way that I've sort of been taught about guilt is that guilt is, it is quite a helpful emotion because it sort of points out to a point, points out to a points out to us when we have behaved in a way that's not in alignment with our values, right? When we've wronged someone, when we've done something that is, is counter to how we want to be in the world and who we want to be in the world. Um, so I, I found that idea really, really fascinating um, but just to, to sort of, because it, this is a really rich book, there's a ton of stuff in here. And as you were saying, you know, it's a really um, interesting explanation. But just to go back to the, the very beginning, he talks about guilt, shame and anxiety from an evolutionary perspective, which I, I thought this was really interesting because he starts off by making the point that when people talk about Darwin, they often use the term survival of the fittest. And I think he points out is that Darwin only uses the term survival of the fittest um, a couple of times when he's talking about evolution, whereas he uses the word love 
maybe I think 100% more <laughs> than he uses that term, um, something like that. I think he uses the term survival of the fittest twice while he's talking about it, even though that's the term that everybody's picked up on. Whereas yeah. he uses the term love sort of 93 times or something like that. And he makes the point that natural selection favours those who are able to give aid to each other. It's a really misconstrued idea, this whole survival of the fittest idea. Yeah, I mean, he's got this evolutionary explanation or theory of guilt, shame and anxiety, which I, which I found really interesting, which is that guilt, shame and anxiety are mechanisms for social control. Mm. And they were necessary or they, they evolved uh, because human beings, because they're so intelligent, they're capable of incredible damage. It, like he, he makes the point that humans are both the most loving creatures and also the most violent of the mammals, I think, or some like, like they have the capacity for to be both extremely loving and also extremely violent towards each other. And that in our evolutionary history, we've got this incredible ability to cooperate and, and you know, made we've made incredible progress as a species because of our ability to cooperate, but also we kill each other all the time. We've got this incredible capability of killing each other. And, and the idea is that the only way that humans were able to kind of grow as cooperative uh, tribes or groups or, or um, yeah, basically tribes was by having social control mechanisms. And guilt, shame and anxiety were essentially the social control mechanisms for controlling the young. And basically, it's a way of controlling kids is, is the idea behind these emotions that guilt, shame and anxiety stops kids from using violence before they're able before they're fully socialized and before they understand like the rules of the tribe and stuff like that but it's also used as a social control mechanism kind of within human societies as well primitive societies and his basic idea is that that's where it comes from but it's not the only way to prevent violence and to get on together and cooperate and that's where the whole sort of alternatives that he talks about in terms of of how to be loving and mm -hmm. how to be rational come in. But the interesting thing that I thought is that it is a very interesting theory about why these emotions evolved and that they do have a function, but their function was mainly for the benefit of the adults in controlling children and infants. And that in a way, his whole argument is, you know, you now have to grow out of these emotions that were sort of instilled in you as a way of controlling you as a child and we as a species kind of have to grow up from using this kind of primitive method of control to using our reason to actually think through these things rather than you know these so-called negative emotions does that make sense in terms of his theory absolutely because he one of the points that he makes is that 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 conflict between violence and aggression and being a very social species is that conflict is constantly going on in all of us, whether we're aware of it or not. In fact, he has a lovely quote and he says, no, no other social creature is as violent as we are. No other violent creature is as social as we are. Mm. And that that is the constant conflict that as individuals and as a human race, we're constantly living in. As he said, you know, he, he sort of suggests that guilt, shame and anxiety are these prehistoric emotions, are emotions that people have felt um, and I, you know, I found this quite a comforting thought. He makes the point that even though we feel very alone and burdened by our own guilt, shame and anxiety, that people have been feeling this way for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, you can imagine sort of your ancestors sitting around a fire at some point, <laughs> feeling all the same feelings about completely different things in a completely different context. But they, they are very prehistoric emotions in that way. But as you said, you know, they're also, they serve a purpose in childhood. He differentiates between morality and ethics what he suggests is that parents and society often use guilt, shame and anxiety to teach children morality. Whereas as adults, what we want to do is grow beyond that and develop our own set of ethics. The way he describes morality, and I thought this was quite interesting, is that morality is essentially what everyone else around us is doing. Imposes on you. Yeah. yeah. And as we all know, if we think about that, examples of that that's not always the quote right thing right just because everybody's doing something doesn't mean it is actually the right thing to do and so he separates that morality out from ethics and he says ethics are your own personal principles they are the things that as children you're not you're not capable of that level of rationality you're not capable necessarily 
of, you know, even though adults try and explain why they are punishing children for certain things and so on, in rational terms, children don't necessarily have the mental faculties and the intellectual faculties to have that degree of rationality yet. And so for them, these experiences of punishment, reward, and so on, they get turned into these messages that get based in guilt, shame, and anxiety. And so, yeah, he says that as adults, one of the ways that we transcend guilt, shame, and anxiety is to step away from morality and develop our own set of reasoned, logical, and rational principles and ethics. Yeah, it's the difference between not doing something because you're afraid of being caught and punished and not doing something because you believe it's wrong in yeah. your in yourself. Like you think this is not the way that I want to live and these are not the values I want to embody. So it, the morality side is, you know, not doing something because the tribe is going to punish you or you're going to get found out or something, which is kind of imposed from the outside to not doing something because you don't think it's the right way to live. And you then you've kind of internalized and have, you've got your own ethical value system that has become part of you and your identity as a person as opposed to just something that you know you will feel shame because of other people yeah. if you if you don't do something it's that that actually reminds me of the definition i don't think he talks about this in the book but it reminds me of the definition of integrity or one of the definitions of integrity and i cannot remember where i heard this but it's a really neat little definition and it goes integrity is what you do when no one else is looking yeah yeah. And so it's essentially, it's, yeah, it's who, what your personal set of principles are for you as an individual, regardless of what other people around you are doing and thinking and so on. Mm. Yeah, and I think the, the thing that was really interesting for me is that his argument is that guilt, shame and anxiety are they're very primitive sort of social control tools and they don't even work in your adult life. They don't even mm. help you. And so his idea is that, you know, it's not that they, they put you on the right course and that you should sort of trust your feelings, so to speak, because these feelings, his argument is that what they do more than anything else is they immobilize you. So he's, yeah. he makes the point that when you're really suffering from anxiety, you can't think properly. You're, you're not able to properly process and, and work out what the right steps are. And when you're suffering from shame, you're not thinking properly. You're just kind of immobilized by these feelings. And that was sort of what their evolutionary purpose was, was to kind of control the kids and stop the kids doing stuff, right? But his, his point is that you shouldn't trust these emotions in the sense that they don't, they just, what they do is they just kind of seize you up and prevent you from actually working out what the right thing to do is and, and working out how you can move forward and, and make amends for what you've done because he does provide an alternative in this book it's not that he just says you know instead of guilt shame and anxiety do whatever you like and forget about the consequences <laughs> or something he definitely provides an alternative and his 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 idea is that rather than feeling guilty and feeling shame and feeling anxious what you need to do is make restitution so you need to work out what you've done that's wrong to somebody else and work out how you can make it better and work through and basically make it up to them, you know, mm. and, and that's a very positive, rational approach. So he does say that you should feel um, remorse, which is like the acknowledgement, oh, I've, I've done something that isn't right. That right, I... it's what, which is what a lot of other psychologists and researchers talk about in the context of guilt. Right, but that rather than, ra the guilt would be like, I'm bad, yeah. whereas the remorse would be, this, it wasn't fair of me to do this, and I need to make it up to that person. How can I make it up to them? And that's sort of like a much more rational and positive approach to how to kind of approach, to think about it. I think um, just as a technicality, I think technically guilt is I did something bad, shame is I am bad. But he makes the point that even with guilt here, um, guilt is different from remorse because when we experience guilt, we're actually more likely to avoid Right, exactly. That we did. It's right? not that... So we're more likely to try and not think about it. We're more likely to get defensive in the face of other people. For example, if we've wronged someone in the face of them bringing it up with us or in the face of being reminded about what we did. Every time those guilty feelings come up, we're going to try and avoid it. Yeah. And I got, I've got. i just made a, note, a couple of quotes here on, on this. Like he says, for example, to flourish emotionally, we need to question and reject the idea that there is any justification for taking orders from guilt, shame and anxiety. These negative emotions are imperfect remnants of evolution and child development that impede mature, rational and loving conduct in adults. So he's really clear that, you know, 
we just shouldn't be following these uh, these emotions and then he also says feeling guilty ashamed or anxious does not make us better people it makes us less rational and less effective if we have committed misdeeds in adulthood our negative legacy emotions can become so painful that we cannot face what we did to, to stimulate them their demoralizing impact ends up impeding our effort towards personal responsibility and personal growth. So that's exactly what you were just saying, mm -hmm. that it's not that it it's not that it makes you put things right. Actually, it just makes you go and hide under the blanket and not think about it. Yeah. It's a fascinating argument. It is. And I'm still honestly, I'm still not sure how I feel about mm. it, because I really want to believe <laughs> that that is the case. Um, I mean, I, I agree with I agree with what you've just said, the quotes that you read out. But I, I, what I want to believe is this idea that, OK, it is possible to live a life without feeling guilt, shame and anxiety, because quite frankly, that's not ever an experience I've had. And it sounds great. <laughs> it would, I think it would be great. Um, and obviously, since reading this book, you know, I've, I've really been thinking about how how these three experiences and he talks about other experiences like you just said he he connects guilt shame and anxiety to helplessness and he says they're rooted in helplessness they're inseparable from helplessness mm. um, and they're all rooted in a sense of helplessness in different contexts um, and I think he also says similar things about anger and about um, regret and resentment as well and so from a theoretical standpoint experiencing life without feeling things like resentment and regret and all of these neg what he calls negative legacy emotions sounds great obviously i read his words i can visualize what that looks like but it's really hard to get a felt sense of okay what does that actually feel like <laughs> well there's one part where he talks about the the process and i think it's interesting what you said because i don't think he's arguing that you will just never feel these things the way that he argues it is that um, i'll just read another quick quote here he says these three steps <clears throat> sorry these three steps to emotional freedom can change your life for forever learn to identify guilt shame and anxiety learn to reject them and learn to fill yourself with love for other people life in its many aspects and your greater purposes so i think his point is not so much you know just never feel these things but more like his argument is you need to have a certain attitude towards guilt shame and anxiety which is basically as he says to reject them which is kind of interesting, you know, he's actually saying like, okay, recognize it and reject it and instead work out how to make amends and how to use love in your life essentially is sort of how he's, you know, he's got a whole series of other arguments about yeah. that, which I thought was interesting. And that's a good point, actually, that he, he is saying, you're right, he is saying, he, well, he's not saying you're never going to feel these things or you're never going to have these experiences, but rather he's providing you with an alternative template to how to respond to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of like, I mean, this is not a very good analogy, but it's sort of like, it's, it's not like you're never going to feel hunger. You will feel hungry. But his argument would be right. When you feel this, go and eat something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas, like when you feel guilt, shame and anxiety, then learn to reject that and, and pursue a different course of action than sort of allowing them to immobilize you. Yeah. And I thought that one of the things that was really fascinating is that his argument behind why you should reject them is also that they don't work. Yeah, And that is really interesting because he makes the point that guilt, shame and anxiety never work on the people that they're really supposed to work on, which is the people who've done bad things, right? Mm. So he makes the point that perpetrators of cruelty and, and, you know, things like that, they don't feel guilty because they have justifications for what they're doing and they feel quite good about hurting the people that they want to hurt. And I thought that was really interesting is that we imagine that... When somebody's behaving really badly, it's because they don't they haven't been shamed and they need to be shamed in order to stop them behaving badly so that they feel this guilt and shame. But his point is that doesn't work on the people who you want it to work on because they have justifications for what they're doing. And rather than feel guilt and shame, they'll just get worse, you know, and they'll actually kind of resist um, feeling those feelings themselves because they have excuses and they have justifications. Mm. which I thought was really interesting because I certainly, when you see someone behaving badly, you know, one imagines how can that person live with themselves? And his answer is they actually can live with themselves very well because they've got all these justifications for what they're doing. Yeah, they are involved in a process of rationalization. It's just not the same kind of rational thinking and ethical thinking that he's talking about. Right, exactly. 
Yeah, I really like the fact that he, in one, towards the end of the book, he makes the point as well that not only are guilt, shame and anxiety, you know, a lot of the book is about our social relationships with other people, um, about our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with other people as well, and how guilt, shame and anxiety not only affect our relationship with ourselves, but also in inhibit our relationships with other people too. Um, but there's a bit that I really like where he, he sort of takes this idea that guilt, shame and anxiety just don't work as emotions, that they're actually counterproductive. And um, just to read a quote, he says, we're also likely to experience overwhelming self-defeating emotional reactions at exactly the moment that we're contemplating or doing anything new that matters to us. These reactions can overcome us when we're engaging in a hobby or recreational activity that we love. They can overcome us when we merely think about doing something that we've always wanted to do, from finding a better job to improving our marriage to simply enjoying a vacation or a few quiet moments beside a lake. Um, and then he goes on to say, our primeval legacy emotions can hinder us in the most important and productive activities on earth, um, including raising our children with discipline and love, etc., etc. Right. Um, what I really appreciated about that is he paints a very clear picture of just just how unhelpful these emotions are. So he's saying, look, it's not just you. It's not just about you and it's not just about your relationships, but it's also about how alive you are and how much you make of the time that you have on this planet and ultimately sort of what kind of, you know, funnily enough, they're called leg legacy emotions, but it's about what kind of legacy you leave as well as a person. You know, what do you allow yourself to do during your time on this earth? And I thought that was a really powerful image. Yeah. It's a very interesting one because he's arguing that, if you're feeling these things, it's it's getting in the way and it's counterproductive because it's actually stopping you from living your full life. Yeah. And he, he even goes on to, I want to read you a quick quote. This is a really interesting one related to what you're just saying because he even goes on to argue that if you're feeling guilt, shame and anxiety is you're not the right person to be feeling these, you're almost certainly not the right person to be feeling these things. So here's what he says. He says, here is another key to life. People who seriously or persistently abuse other people almost never feel bad about it. Instead, it is the victims who suffer emotionally. If you feel a great deal of guilt and shame, you almost certainly do not deserve it. Mm. I thought that was fascinating because that argument is like, look, if you're feeling this, you almost certainly don't deserve it. And I was thinking, wow, is that really, is that really valid? And you I know? think that's, that's also where it, that that statement provoked a degree of skepticism from me. You know, obviously now taking into account everything else that you've just mentioned and what he goes on to describe in the book about how perpetrators don't feel guilt, shame and anxiety. But there's, I think there's a, one of the chapters is actually called, but don't we need guilt and shame? Yeah. And that was my exact question yeah. <laughs> when I first heard that argument is that, but don't these things actually serve a purpose? Aren't they useful? And he unequivocally says, no, they yeah. do not, because it's always the wrong people who are feeling them. Exactly. Basically, what he's saying is it's it's the good people who feel guilt, shame and anxiety and the cruel people don't feel that anyway. So and that, you know, people can do things wrong and still feel guilt, shame and anxiety, but that those feelings are not helpful feelings to feel if you actually want to make amends. Yeah, exactly. Right? If you actually want to do something about it and live your life as a better person. In fact, the, as you were saying earlier, if you do want to make amends, guilt, shame, and anxiety are probably just going to get you to not want to think about it and bury it and not do the right thing rather than actually getting you... In order to do the right thing, you have to engage your rational mind and think through the problem, think about what you've done, come up with solutions and make restitution. And he's making the point that as long as you're, in a sense, I mean, this is not his words, but wallowing in your own guilt, shame, and anxiety, you're not actually helping whoever it is that you've wronged. You right. Know. And this is where the helplessness piece comes back in again. Yeah. Um, it's because when we feel guilt, let's let's stick with guilt or shame, you know, if we've done something wrong, um, that those feelings are rooted in helplessness and they lead to inaction, which further it sort of it becomes a vicious cycle of helplessness because we're not taking any action. We're beating ourselves up about it. We're feeling guilty, but we're not actually doing anything exactly. to write it. And that in terms of that quote that you had earlier on, I think that also means not just in terms of doing right by other people who if you've done something that you that you feel remorse for but also just in terms of living your own life and living up to your potential that yeah. your own guilt shame and anxiety is what stops you from actually you know living to the full and and being able to do the things that um you would find scary you know because they would be epic things to do yeah he makes that point particularly in relation to anxiety i don't know if you remember this part i'm going to try and quote it accurately from memory but he he says something, he's, he's, he goes through how guilt, shame and anxiety 
most frequently manifest in terms of what people say and how they respond to certain situations. And he says that for anxiety, you know, he'll have people in his office who, from an outsider's perspective, are not really doing anything to try and better their lives or to improve their situation. And they'll sit there saying, I'm trying so hard, I'm doing everything I can. Mm. And he says, again, that that is a feeling of helplessness. And that connects to what you're saying about, you know, it impacts the rest of our lives as well. Yeah, because he was sort of trying to make the point to his patients that they're they're saying, I'm doing everything I can. And he's trying to convey to them, look, that's exactly what's not happening. Mm -hmm. You're actually immobilized. You're not doing everything that you can. And but it just it's that sort of vicious cycle that that they get stuck in. Yeah. Just to take a slightly different direction, another piece of this book that I really appreciated which I'll say fits in with other books that we've done like The Myth of Mental Illness by Thomas Satz is that Peter Bregan is very anti-drugs yeah psychiatric drugs psychiatric Psych- drugs. psychotropic yeah. drugs psychotropic yeah. drugs yes thank you um, and so later on in the book, you know, obviously the book is primarily about guilt, shame and anxiety. But as I said earlier, he also goes on to talk about other neg- negative legacy emotions like anger um, and depression is one as well. And he he makes a point that I thought was really, really interesting because he, he talks at the beginning of the book about how all of these, the, the guilt, the shame, the anxiety are born from a feeling of helplessness. But as adults, we actually, you know, and you can see this helplessness in, in the justifications that people give for feeling their guilt, shame and anxiety, like we were just talking about with, you know, I'm doing everything I can. Mm. Um, but he says, as adults, we usually don't recognize that helplessness. And usually how it shows up is either anger or numbness. And numbness, obviously, it can be manifest as anything from boredom to, you know, full blown depression. And he made a lovely point, which I thought was just you know, it's, it's a great example of how he's very straightforward in this book, but he's also an incredibly compassionate writer. Um, and there's a section called You Are As Passionate As You Are Depressed. And how basically um, he says the intensity of our guilt and depression is proportional to proportional to our passionate desire for more joy and excitement. Mm. I thought that was a really interesting point. Um, he said, this is another reason not to think of ourselves as, quote, clinically depressed or, quote, mentally ill and not to turn to psychiatric medications, alcohol or other drugs. The moment we feel lowest is the moment of our greatest challenge. Feeling down and out or lost presents the opportunity at last to recognize and confront our disabling and debilitating feelings of guilt. It can inspire us to begin the work of overcoming our negative legacy emotions and replacing them with a better viewpoint on life. Yeah. Yeah, he's a very humane guy. And, and as you say, he's got great compassion for people. And I also really appreciated the fact that he really speaks out against this culture of um, diagnosing people in, who are experiencing general men, genuine mental suffering, diagnosing them with some basically su- supposed mental illness and giving them psychotropic drugs and sh- sort of sending them off to just mm. base, knock back drugs and, and zone out, essentially. And his approach is a very much a, about, uh, rather than just drugging people, helping people to gain better self-knowledge and understand why they're suffering and what these feelings that they're suffering with, which is actually mostly about guilt, shame and anxiety, yeah. why they're suffering these feelings and why it's having a debilitating effect on them so they can actually, through self-knowledge, get to a greater awareness of, of their own behavior and understanding of what they're doing and less be less self-damaging and actually have more, um, you know, a more fulfilling life. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the process that, you know, I was reading this book and thinking, wow, I really want to find out what this process is because it sounds amazing. And it's actually incredibly simple. And it's a reflection of a lot of other stuff that we've read in similar books as well, um, which, as you said, you know, he uses it, he uses a great metaphor of um, weeds in the garden and he says you know when you when you go into your garden for the first time in a long time you've got to pull up all the weeds first and then the flowers will shine through but it's a process of you know identifying the weeds and then pulling them up and preventing them from growing anymore um, and every time you see a weed pulling it up rather than just letting it flourish so what, as a, what are the meat weeds in, in this metaphor I, I remember the bit but just for, for people who haven't read it well the weeds are negative legacy emotions right right so i think you you outlined this earlier you were saying um that his, his three steps to emotional freedom are identify negative legacy emotions, reject compliance with these emotions, and triumph over and transcend these emotions, which is obviously, it's a very complex process. It's a long-term process, but I read that and I thought, you know, that's doable, I yeah. think, actually. And th- as part of that process, you know, one thing that he writes about really beautifully in this book is love. Mm. And he, because 
what, it's not just a question of rejecting the negative legacy emotions. He makes the point that you have to positively focus on the things that you love in life and actually bring those things into your consciousness and be aware of what you love. And his definition of love is essentially, I think it's positive awareness is the way that he puts it. It's just like if you, if you or joyful awareness, sorry, that's yes, it, joyful, joyful awareness. awareness. If you are aware of something and it brings you joy, you know, whether that's a relationship with your partner or even if it's just like your, your dog or, you know, a place that you love to be, then that if you're aware of joy that is love and he makes the point you know if you're in a relationship and the person makes you feel miserable all the time it's probably not love you know it's probably yeah. like it's, it's and a, you can't love someone too much as well that's what he said yeah you know, that's I, that's not love that's guilt shame and anxiety coming in if that's the way you feel and i thought that was a really great straightforward down to earth you know way of cutting through all of the sort of bullshit about toxic relationships you know people people love in rela- yeah <laughs> all the whole love hurts idea and yeah. his but his argument is no you know actually love doesn't hurt it's you know love makes you feel joyful right if you're yeah. with someone and they make you feel miserable it's not love it's essentially some acting out of of uh, of trauma that's going on there yeah it does feel important to say obviously you know if you are if you're in a relationship with someone for example you're probably going to have conflicts with them you're almost certainly going to have conflicts with them but the point is that that is not part of love per se that is the the negative legacy emotions again you know the hangovers from childhood um all that kind of conditioning clashing yeah i mean and obviously even in positive relationships everyone's going to have conflicts at some point but i think the point it's pretty sort of straightforward that he's making that you know if you if you pick up the phone to someone and they make you know you, you feel a sense of dread about mm. that person that's not love you know that's mm. not and and basically his argument is focus on on being more aware of where you can exercise love in your life and where you can actually you know practice love and be more loving as a person and his argument is essentially you have to you have to be a source of love you can't just like hope for it to come along in in life you actually have to provide love into the world and that also is a way of working against being immobilized by negative legacy emotions yeah and he he also talks about um empathy and vulnerability as being intrinsically connected with love so for example he says that in some situations you know, expressing long repressed anger can be helpful, but if you're going to do it in a healthy way, it needs to come with vulnerability. Yeah. It needs to, you know, it's, it's one thing to express your anger at someone, but you also need to be vulnerable about why you're feeling angry and not just blame them and so on. And the same thing he says with, is with empathy, um, that, you know, if we're really going to love people, we need to be able to empathize with them, which is to put ourselves in their shoes, not to necessarily have the same experiences they have or feel all the feelings that they're feeling but just to understand them you know whether or not we agree with or condone the way that they're living and the decisions that they've made and the way they behave yeah absolutely do you have anything else that you want to say one of the things that i didn't i don't a hundred percent understand yet and i think i need to mull it over in in his argument is when he talks about where these emotions come from um, he's sort of saying that they come from our evolutionary history in that, you know, before, um, before we were more evolved, we only had guilt, shame and anxiety as control mechanisms. And before we had more rational thinking and ability to, you know, think these things through, we needed guilt, shame and anxiety as a species, right? But he's also saying this stuff was used on you when you were a child, and it's a part of the way that parents use this and you need to grow out of it in your own life. Mm. And so when he talks about prehistory, sometimes I wasn't really clear whether he meant he was talking about each of our own personal histories in terms of our parents and the way that we were treated as children. Because he is very, he's very he got a lot to say about parenting and it's very interesting. And he talks about, you know, basically overcoming some of the things that probably happened to you as a kid. And he does talk about, um, you know, all of the, uh, abusive types of behavior that can have a huge effect on guilt, shame, and anxiety. If you don't mind me jumping in, he also makes the point that whether or not you've experienced, you know, what would be called child abuse or traumatic events or anything, anything of that nature, that everybody comes out of childhood with some kind of emotional damage, right? right. It's just inevitable. Yeah. And 
everybody comes out with some kind of because of the way that we are raised and particularly because of the way society uses guilt shame and anxiety as well um, and this is where the morality versus ethics piece comes in because society has such a huge influence on the way that we are raised on the messages that we receive and the way that we are parented like we all come out with this these negative legacy emotions right regardless of obviously there's different scales of it different degrees of it we're, we're all somewhere on a spectrum but you know regardless of sort of how great our parents were or you know how they treated us or whatever um that it's it's actually i think he uses even uses the word inevitable yeah and i, I mean i totally understand his argument about how your parents will have had this impact on you and left you with a legacy of guilt shame and anxiety and that's sort of one theory it like it's from your parents and your individual childhood mm. and i also understand this argument about our evolution as a species and how it's from our evolution that that's where it comes from and sometimes i wasn't sure which which one of these was more important to him he seems to argue from both and sometimes they also seem to be sort of blended it's a bit of both and it doesn't it's not like a huge important topic but uh, this is one of the things that i was a little bit unclear about in the book is that which of these is is the most important thing that he's talking about and when you say most important do you mean which of these is, which of these does he seem to think has had the biggest impact on us as we are today yeah exactly mm-hmm. yeah and so I just got a little bit, uh, I remember thinking a couple of times like, okay, well, is it, is it from your own individual childhood that he's really arguing this? Or is this, is he talking about this is coming from our prehistory as a species is where this comes from? And, and I guess the, the reason that that is relevant is how much could better parenting minimize the legacy of guilt, shame and anxiety? How much can you have an impact on it? Because if it's more from parenting then you can potentially, you know, give your kids a start with no guilt, shame and anxiety, right? But if it's also more from evolution, then this is something that they're going to have regardless of how awesome a parent you are. Mm. And I didn't really, un- and I, maybe he deliberately doesn't make that 100% clear because he doesn't know himself. I don't know. But I wasn't 100% clear on what where that line was. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's an interesting question. I hadn't thought of that before, but it makes a lot of sense. And just going back to what what you were actually saying to me earlier, that you know, when you say with better parenting, can kids grow up with no guilt, shame, and anxiety? I wonder if, I wonder if the overall summary of the guilt, shame, and anxiety issue is that because of our prehistory, i.e., our ancestors and evolution and how we have so soci- how we've developed to deal with this conflict between being inherently violent beings and also inherently social beings is to develop guilt shame and anxiety and that with better parenting it's perhaps not the case that we will raise kids who just don't feel that but we'll teach them better ways of responding to it and dealing with it yeah They'll be able to recognize it super easily and deal with it better. So because speak. I think I think the point that he makes in the book is that we have a predisposition to those emotions, mm. these unhelpful negative legacy emotions, and that often this is greatly exacerbated by society and by parenting. That's actually a very good summary of his argument. You're right. He's saying that we've got a predisposition from evolution, but that, that parents tap into that. And, and basically and society, like government, and, you know, yeah. the way that the way that society in general, the way that people talk about other people the mess a lot of the messages that we receive in our culture are very based in guilt shame and anxiety yeah yeah i don't really have anything sort of much more to say about it except i do want to say i just a hundred percent recommend people read this book i think i think of all the books that we've read i've probably said this before but of all the ones we've read i think you should read this if you're going to read anything i would read this because i think it's it's challenging And it's also very, very practical and relevant. We've always tried to choose books that are relevant for, you know, stuff that can help you in your personal life. But I think this is a a fantastic book. Absolutely, I agree. I wouldn't say this is necessarily... Oh, it's so hard to choose. (laughs) That's why I don't want to say this is the number one book that we've read so far, but it's definitely in my top five. (laughs) I think it's my number one. Because we've read so many great books, you know, like Carl Rogers, and I also enjoyed, um, you know, Road Less Traveled and books like that. It's so hard to choose between them. They're all slightly different and special in their own way. (laughs) 
but it's it's a fantastic book it's a really really as, as you were saying at the beginning it's a thought-provoking fantastic book um and I, I I can tell for myself that it's a great book because I you know I read it a few months ago and I was looking back through my notes now and I could feel it definitely provoking resistance in me as I was saying earlier you know this this sense of oh I don't know surely we need <laughs> guilt, guilt shame and anxiety and and that that's that sort of keys me into the the fact that that is my own guilt shame and anxiety that's my own kind of negative legacy feelings coming up there pushing back against these ideas and so it's it's a really it's it's definitely a book that will teach you more about yourself just from noticing how you react to some of the ideas in it but also will sort of clue you into okay here are some steps that you can take next um, and get and provide you with a really compassionate alternative perspective of what these things actually mean and how to how to kind of grapple with them in your in your daily life yeah and it's so strongly argued which i think is a good thing that even if you don't agree with it you'll it'll have you thinking it'll get you thinking and it'll get you like pondering this and and that's got to be a good thing yeah definitely i can always tell when a book has been quote good it's not necessarily by how much I've enjoyed it while I'm reading it although I did really enjoy this book but how much I think about it afterwards <laughs> how often it pops into my head just as I'm going about my my day-to-day life and this this book is definitely one of those books that has stayed with me um and it's been great reading through my notes again coming back to it for this conversation so I don't have anything else really to say about it either but just to finish up um, at the very end of the book, he shares a few li- basic life-enhancing principles. So I thought it'd be nice just to share those to end on, Absolutely. To end on that note. So he says, review the following principles and apply them to your own life. They can enormously enhance your life. Do not take psychoactive substances to solve emotional problems and do not encourage loved ones to take them. You will be more in touch with your emotions and more fully able to relate to other people. Keep in mind that you or your loved ones may need to withdraw from psychiatric drugs carefully with supervision to be safe and that no one should be coerced into taking or stopping psychiatric drugs. Number two, work together with loved ones, co-workers and others others towards mutual empowerment. Number three, never bully or coerce other people. Instead, create free, respectful relationships with everyone in your life. Four, Respect and encourage each person's autonomy and independence and you will avoid feeling guilty, anxious, ashamed, frustrated and angry or numb because of them as they struggle with the ups and downs of their lives. Five, love and feel empathy for as many people as you can. It will help you banish your self-defeating emotions and move forward with your life. Caring about people and loving them as separate and independent human beings can keep us sane and happy and as beneficial to others as possible but it is not without challenges. There will be temptations to indulge our darker nature and do something for the sake of short-term advantage or power. There will be times when it will take courage to do what we know to be right. Often it seems to be risky to take the principled, honourable and empathic road, but as rocky as it can be, it remains the best road and really the only one on which we can live a good life. So I think that's a nice place to end this conversation. Very well said. So yeah, as we've been saying really recommend the book guilt shame and anxiety by peter bregan so i hope you've enjoyed listening to this conversation today and i really hope you check out the book we will be back very soon with another psychology book that's up for discussion and review thanks a lot for listening thanks guys